uh, I am not a polished public speaker, um, but I do think um, some of the content I'm bringing today should be entertaining. So hopefully, you find that to be true for yourself. So I tried to do some research uh, before putting this presentation together as far as uh, different presentation styles. I found some TED Talks on Disney uh, short storytelling. Uh, so it seems a little cartoonish. That's kind of what I themed off of. Uh, Any of the title of this presentation is Malware Analysis Short Story. Uh, specifically, what I'm going to try zeroing on in on as far as malware analysis is concerned is memory analysis and debugging. Um, please realize there are uh, many uh, tools, tactics, techniques that, that you might engage in or perform uh, malware analysis. This is a very, uh, this is really just the tip of the iceberg that we're going to be covering today. Uh, just a quick little disclaimer. Uh, anything you see today uh, is not related to anything I've done for any of my prior employers. Uh, it doesn't reflect any of their views. Uh, everything you see today is from me. Okay, uh, so who am I? Um, <clears throat> so Peter Starfinger, you heard the name. Uh, I've probably got a little over 15 years in uh, doing a variety of things, uh, everything from uh, security engineering, security architecture, uh, pen testing, uh, you know, you name it. Uh, my focus today is more around forensic investigations and incident response. Uh, so I am a a lot more focused nowadays. Um, <clears throat> as far as my accreditations, you know, between degrees and certifications and all that, I've managed to acquire 65% of the alphabet. So, almost got soup. That's what I'm shooting for. Um, again, I'm a digital forensic incident response consultant. Uh, and as far as public work, so I'm not really a, a public guy, hence my opener about I'm not a public speaker. Um, but if you want to look up some of the stuff I've done, uh, Malware Risk and Mitigation Report, I was a major contributor to that. Um, also, I wrote, uh, I'm the sole author of the Mobile Technology uh, Layered Security Model. Um, do check that out. Um, I think both of these are hosted at NIST. So, pretty interesting to me. Um, go to the next. Okay, so how's the story going to flow? Um, so we're going to talk about how malware analysis fits in. Um, you know, I, I really don't want to focus uh, too much, you know, the hands-on side, hopefully it's interesting to you, uh, but really I hope to, to make the case why you guys should pick this up as a skill set. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting, you know, I've encountered so many different business leaders over the years, InfoSec leaders, and it's not clear in everyone's mind how this fits in. So I'll try to make the case to you to where academically you might make a consideration to add this to your list of things you're trying to learn. Um, also, the escalating path, um, <clears throat> I just kind of want to show a little bit around methodology. Um, from a methodology perspective, we're going to be kind of jumping over some steps. And there's a lot to talk about there. Uh, maybe in another talk we can hit some other steps along the way that you might go through uh, performing this malware analysis. Um, also, technical things, uh, things you probably should know. So I'll give you a little one-liners uh, on a number of different topics. Um, it's definitely not going to make you a pro, but it may give you some pivots as far as research you might do to up your personal game uh, if I do manage to sell this to you. Um, and then finally, our malcode SCAR. Um, I went out, uh, one of the advantages of working uh, uh, in the commercial sector, uh, specifically uh, in the uh, cyber realm, is that we do have access to things like virus total intelligence. And so a couple weeks ago, I went out there and I said, what's the newest thing that nothing is detecting right now? And so I got SCAR. Well, it turns out SCAR is old, if any of you want to check the uh, open source intelligence on that. But anywho, so we ended up with SCAR for this presentation. Um, okay. 
And then as far as, uh, so let's get into fitting in. So, yeah, so where's malware analysis fit in? So we start thinking about, you know, just ABCs, everything usually comes down to network defense, right? If we can deny our adversary, uh, you know, access to, you know, the things that we think are important, uh, you know, typically that's, that's first done from a network perspective. Uh, the way malware analysis complements that is that you can typically find indicators of compromise uh, from the different malwares you might encounter as a part of your, if you're doing this professionally, a part of your day-to-day -day work. And what that allows your network defense guys to do is everything from maybe something as simple as IP blocking um, all the way to uh, potentially signatures on behavior uh, based on how the malware may need to communicate on a network in order to be functional. So that's that connection. And then incident response, <clears throat> I can't tell you guys uh, how many times during IR, you know, you may have one thing that triggers, right? It could be a known bad IP, uh, you know, a ping just happened to fly somewhere it shouldn't, and that's what causes that team to come together. And now we're trying to figure out what it is that's going on so we can contain it and figure out how it happened and all that. Well, what malware analysis brings to the table is that a lot of times there's going to be uh, software involved that the bad guy is introduced into your environment. And so if you have some of these skills, you can triage malware quickly and get stuff back out there to that bigger incident response team that will help them make modifications you know, either to the network, to the endpoints affected, or maybe even be able to communicate risk as far as you know, uh, what might be stolen or gained by the software being there. Um, with respect to digital forensics, you know, post-mortem is a big deal in the industry nowadays. You know, this, forensics isn't just for cops, um, <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. Um, it's a significant advantage uh, for um, really in any industry, you know, whether it's, you know, private sector, on the government side, uh, you name it, uh, when it comes to forensics, uh, a lot of times understanding the, the inner workings of software allow you to, again, pull out these indicators that your uh, digital forensic guys can use to help reassemble the picture and how bad the compromise really was to that endpoint. And when we say digital forensics, just to highlight this, digital forensics tends to cover a, a wide span of things, and it's everything from memory forensics to network forensics to log forensics. And usually, uh, you know, when when your investigator is coming to the table attempting to do that post-mortem analysis, again, if, if you've done your malware analysis, they're going to know right what to look at, both from a network log, memory, disk forensic perspective, and those pivots will allow them to reconstruct the picture. So going forward, again, the business can make better decisions. Um, from an information risk management perspective, again, a lot of, you know, we think about malware. Malware is usually smaller than the off-the-shelf product that we tend to use. You know, it's not a Microsoft Office suite, you know, it's usually not that big. Typically, uh, you know, when we're talking about malware, it's usually very uh, purpose-built code. It's smaller. And understanding that function and that capability uh, allows you to better articulate from a risk management perspective what either the exposure or loss was by that particular malware being in the environment. <coughs> Um, keywords, exposure, and loss. Um, cyber intel, man. So cyber intel is an interesting space, right? Because there's a lot of, one of the funny things is you'll, you'll encounter nowadays on the professional side, a lot of guys will tell you they're in the cyber intel space. And really most of these people are consumers. And what that means is they're all sitting around hoping somebody's going to drop some information in their hands. Well, one of the reasons malware analysis ends up being advantageous for in-house uh, cyber intel folks is that once you start becoming a producer, I mean, you're producing your own intel on the people who are hitting you and the specific tools they're using against you, that puts you at a significant uh, defensive advantage. And then from an intel perspective, that also allows you to cooperate with other professionals to get a much better rounded picture on who your adversary really is. Um, from a warfare perspective, warfare is interesting. Um, you guys probably getting more of that here, I imagine. Um, 
But look, it's like this, right? We need tools to do the job. If you can figure out their tools and break their tools, you can defend or maybe even respond to what it is they're bringing to the table. So that's my warfare side of this. Go ahead, go next. Oh, I got just a little bit of faction here, right? Black sheep. All right, there we go. Keep going. All right, so uh, anyone know this reference? Who this is? Ah, there we go. Tyler Durden. All right. So Mr. Durden, Mr. Durden had some fantastic speech, so I just did a little spin on it. Uh, here's the big deal with malware analysis, okay? <clears throat> in the industry, you talk to InfoSec leaders, especially in the private side. I think the government side's doing a little bit better job getting it. Uh, at the end of the day, man, it's not, you know, it's not your AV, it's not your, your IPS, it's not your artificial intelligence, it's not your big data. All this stuff that we constantly think is going to solve the security issue, the security dilemma, that there are people out there who have interest in infiltrating your environment. What defeats that are other people, and that could be you. And the point with malware analysis is, is that this, this is under, the, the, thing, the thing with, I'm going to use the term, the enemy, the adversary, is that the adversary can be uh, understood, and malware analysis allows us to understand the adversary. The adversary is going to have the exposure to all those products that <coughs> most companies, nation states invest in in order to protect themselves. And so they're going to test and validate all their stuff to know that they're going to be resilient and be able to be persistent within your environment when they do finally decide to make a move. And the only way you're going to beat that is human smarts. Okay. Um, okay, let's go next. So you're the human adversary for the other human adversaries. Um, so the escalating path. Um, so what is the escalating path? So I make a reference, um, you know, if any of you guys choose a incident response, digital forensic, uh, go forward as a professional path. Uh, RFC 3227 is really important. I think you should pay attention to it. Really what that spells out is there's more volatility as far as uh, digital artifacts are concerned. Um, when we start thinking about electronic artifacts as it relates to a computer, everything has a lifetime and memory. And so it's really important that we're sensitive to that. That is a fact. And so when we get out there and we're we're trying to do this malware analysis function, again, you should be sensitive to collecting things in an order based on their lifetime from an electronic perspective. Um, no need to read. Again, 3227. Write that down if you're writing down anything. Oh, and this is also available on GitHub. Okay, so a um, couple public references here. Uh, who knows malware unicorn? Yay, big guys. Look it up, at Malware Unicorn on Twitter, uh, Malware Unicorn on GitHub. Uh, Malware Unicorn is, uh, again, another just practitioner out there, has a lot of great public information that I think helps uh, people, uh, again, if I sell you on this, um, a lot of great information to help you build your skills up quickly uh, and kind of get a little bit of know-how on how to, again, start in the Malware Analysis game. Um, but what Malware Unicorn says, depending on your workload, you want to spend the least amount of time trying to determine what the malware is doing and how to get rid of it. Many malware analysts use their own triage analysis similar to that in the emergency room at the hospital. And so I think, you know, I don't know everyone's professional background here, but the short and sweet there is, is typically when you walk up on a bad situation, you're going to do a quick assessment, okay? And sometimes your quick assessment is enough to lead you to a place where you can make a decision. And so malware analysis has to be treated the same way because there is a, you know, just to be frank, there's a significant vo uh, volume of, of players out there who are, who are in this adversarial space making many, many different tools. And, and there's, no, there's nothing you can do that will allow you to know every little piece of software out there, every tool, tactic, procedure that, again, your opponents will be engaged in. And so... Sometimes you have to deal with uh, what can you do to get a little bit in order to get a lot from either a defensive or an offensive perspective. And kind of the same thing from a SANS perspective. Um, this is from their Windows Forensic Analysis poster. Just kind of what it shows you is, is that there's stuff um, that you can get a lot from, 
that doesn't cost you a lot of time. And then as we escalate, as we start going down this pyramid, down to the point, those things require much, much more specialized skills in order to get a return on the information. Sometimes that's valuable, sometimes it's not. Again, triage, use your triage to drive you as you go further. And we're jumping straight down here, by the way, guys, okay? I'm jumping over all this, so just be sensitive to that. Next. All right, technical things. Um, so on the GitHub, I did put out there um, uh, as part of some of the steps that you'll go through that you should be um, installing some kind of virtualization software. Uh, the key thing with the virtualization software is that we're able to either uh, suspend uh, the guests that we're working with or, um, or take a snapshot. Uh, those file artifacts that are created can be used to perform memory forensics on. So, um, anywho, uh, the virtual box uh, dump file structure is really just an ELF file at the end of the day. Uh, so just keep that in mind if you're analyzing it. Uh, again, Windows memory structure. Um, what's important about Windows memory structure is that, again, if you're out there as a practitioner, uh, I mean, a lar the largest volume of <coughs> endpoints that might end up compromised with some kind of malcode gen generally ends up being Windows. And the reason why is, is that the guys who are producing a lot of these tools out there, you know, they have to consider how are they going to get the most bang for their buck. And most of, again, their potential victims more than likely have Windows infrastructure. And so when we talk about order of volatility, again, in order to be able to um, collect anything from a memory perspective, you really need to understand memory structure and be able to speak to it. Um, PE file structure, um, again, really useful. Um, there's many tools that'll help you with it, but uh, the key thing is from a knowledge perspective is just understanding that when it comes to um, uh, code, compiled code that's gonna run on an endpoint in most of the victims typically being a Windows operating uh, system, Windows operating system uh, PE file structure is going to be really important to understand uh, to just start to break into this space. Um, basic assembly. Um, I'm going to show you some some assembly. Um, it's it's not as bad as you think, and there's great documentation out there to kind of help your journey with dealing with assembly. Um, again, today I'm bringing memory forensics, uh, memory analysis, and debugging to the table. you got to know a little bit of assembly. It's just a part of the game, but we'll get into that. Um, and then the stack itself, um, I think, do you have anybody who's not some kind of computer science in here? Okay, any freshmen that just haven't taken? Okay, so everyone kind of understands stacks. Okay, it's really important to understand what a stack is. Um, again, CPU registers, we'll get into that. Um, some of the, the tools I'll be using today will make a lot of this really easy, but it's just recognizing, you know, again, when you look at that tool, what does that mean when you have values populating in different spots in the program? Uh, again, understanding pointers, um, TCP IP is really key. Uh, the only thing I'm going to focus on today when we do the practical is just how do we get network indicators. There's lots of indicators we could farm for, that's what we're going to farm for today. Uh, and again, DNS. DNS is uh, really key. Uh, you know, computers speak IP. People speak DNS, whether they know it or not. Okay. DNS. Okay. So this is SCAR. Uh, I guess you no know, SCAR is pretty bad, right? It's a lot of red up there. This is Virus Total. Uh, I just checked recently. SCAR is pretty well recognized at this point. Uh, it didn't take long. Um, that's it. Um, the, the short and sweet here, though, is, is uh, you know, whenever you're handling a sample, especially as a malware analyst, you know, there's a little bit of OPSEC involved. And that OPSEC is around, you know, you don't want to blow your cover that you may have, again, that other human adversaries' tools, okay? What I didn't do and what I would never do in practice is upload my sample, okay? You never upload your sample. What you do is you get, you get the cryptographic hash, a little bit of tradecraft for you, and you check that against these open repositories and see if you get results. If you get results, well, then you know you're, you're not exactly a snowflake in this particular attack. Maybe. People reuse tools all the time. 
you don't get a result, that makes that sample even more interesting, which again should spur you on as an analyst from a, should I only do triage, should I only do automated, or should I do more with this, okay? All right, so here we are. We're gonna go ahead and dissect STAR. Um, uh, Citizen STAR is, is where uh, uh, my GitHub is. Uh, there's a subfolder called SCAR. Uh, please take a look out there. There's a little README uh, file. The README file does have some instruction. Uh, please go through that instruction if you want to participate in the practical. Uh, I'll give it just five, ten minutes, and then we'll start digging. Okay. I don't, I don't, do you have everyone's email address? Uh, I do, but it'd be a, it'd be a bit of a fortune, so that email just like that with the way this Okay, okay, cool. So we'll also send out an email uh, with this link. Uh, the only thing that isn't there, all the stuff I'm going to cover today is, is going to be as it happens. Um, this GitHub will get updated as far as what we do today, so you can reenact it if you are not able to follow along uh, during the live analysis. Um, and that's it, guys. All right, uh, let's just take five. For those of you who are going to go connect to it, go ahead and connect to it. Uh, grab SCAR. Don't, don't change SCAR's file extension. Uh, once you get SCAR downloaded and you get set up, then uh, we'll talk through the next steps. Okay, guys, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, you know, for those of you, uh, you, know, if you, you just can't participate, but you're like, you know, you try to look later and you're having some difficulty, just, um, you know, if you want to reach out, feel free to reach out to me uh, through LinkedIn and I can definitely. Uh, help you guys through a lot of this stuff. Um, also, there are some other uh, resources posted out there made available as well, uh, cheat sheets, things like that. And, and I'll make sure I make those available to the club so they can go on with you right, for, because of wikis. Okay, uh, so I'm going to be able to move obviously a lot faster than you guys. Uh, hopefully, everyone is gotten the GitHub and you're kind of able to operate a little bit independently of me. Um, so, here we go. All right, guys. So, this is REM Workstation. Um, you're going to be using Flare in place of it. Uh, once your Flare install is done, you'll find all your tools on a single folder on the desktop. Uh, it should be the same tools that I just demonstrate here. Um, again, af after I get through presenting, um, I will be available for as long as you guys are here so we can discover those tools together if you do have a hard time finding them. Um, so this is REM Workstation. Again, it's effectively the same thing as uh, Flare. Um, this is produced by uh, SANS versus uh, Flare is produced by the folks at Mandian. Um, again, this is uh, Remnux. Uh, Remnux is also produced by the folks at SANS. Uh, again, it is uh, freely available, as you can see through GitHub. Um, what I'm doing on my Remnux uh, is, is a couple things. One, in order to make sure we don't have a mess up, meaning a spillage, where our mal code is able to call home, we want to make sure that uh, we are connected to a host only network. So on your network adapter, make sure it's host only uh, once all your installs are complete. This is really important. The other thing that's really important, after all of our installs are complete, is that we snapshot our host. And so for each for any of the virtualization technologies uh, being used today, uh, make sure you take a snapshot before we start interacting with Malco. And I'm just going to do a little safety check on my end. You know, one of the, the big tricks uh, with malware analysis is that you want to control as many of the variables as possible. And so this isn't just about, let's see, this isn't just about making sure that our Malco can't call home or us losing, uh, well, that's really what it's all about. It, one of the factors is, is is not losing OPSEC, which means you lose control of the code. But the other factor, too, is, is that as you introduce other components for the mal code to interact with during your analysis, again, you're doing that in a controlled fashion so you can observe each function of the mal code.
So what I'm doing now is I do uh, my, my base operating system. Uh, this is Malco that's meant for a Windows operating system. And so for today's presentation, I chose Mac OS X just to kind of help me protect myself. Um, do consider that uh, if, if you know you're going to be dealing with malware packages that are designated for very specific operating systems, try to make sure your host is one of the other operating systems available just because it reduces the risk to you as an analyst. Uh, again, I have uh, made, made this where there's a little bit less risk to you if you are running Windows as your base operating system by changing the file extension to ZZZ. Uh, one of the things about Windows operating system is that it, it's really, it really needs the right extension in order to know how to handle the file that's on the system. Okay. And here I'm just dropping it. I think I'm dropping it. Scars on my this is my Windows system. Another trick in the industry is to also make sure that you have different backgrounds. Uh, a lot of people uh, find it easier to cue on color uh, when they're moving through their different environments. Uh, a lot of you will find as you go down the road that you may create uh, other infrastructure in your analysis environment to help enable you do your job. And so using different color backgrounds just kind of makes it a little bit easier for the brain to pick up, you know, on, oh, I'm on my management system. Oh, I'm on my, you know, again, and the reason for all this is we don't want to lose control. We always want to maintain OPSEC. We always want to introduce the, the stimuli. And then, of course, make our observations as we make different uh, stimuli available to our MAL code. Um, what I'm going to do on uh, my Remnux box, one, I'm going to make sure that it's IP. And so you'll have to set a static. And what's important um, about this static is that the other hosts that are on this host only network, I'm going to configure them to look to my Remnux box as both its primary gateway and its DNS server. And that'll help me kind of, again, control and monitor the behavior of the mal code. And so, So I'm giving myself a host ID of two, oh. though my Remnox box has a dot one. It's a good observation. But again, I'm going to make this Remnox box the primary uh, gateway. And I'm also going to make it my DNS server. The other modification I'm going to make just to prepare the analysis environment is to go ahead, there is a script, it's accept all IPs. The nice thing with Remnux is that you can do tab completion. So if you want to write it out, it's accept dash all dash IPs. You start to type the word accept in a tab, it'll complete it for you. It's a nice shell script. It'll make the Remnux box say, hey, I'm everything you're asking for. That's what it does. Oh, and start. Sorry. Okay. Uh, the other thing we're going to do is enable uh, something called fake DNS. And what fake DNS will do is it'll start to reply to everything, um, every request that's made from a DNS perspective. It'll reply and say, hey, that's me. Which again is great for you as an analyst because you want to be able to again see all parts of the communications that are occurring. Uh, and I can't say it enough. Our goal for this particular uh, reversing session is to find network indicators. Okay, so so very very focused on that right now. 
Um, the other thing I'm going to open up to is Wireshark. And the reason I want Wireshark, though that's not, though net forensics or net analysis is not the focus of this session, uh, what Wireshark will allow us to do again is to capture those interactions that the client software expects to have with any server software that it's hoping to speak with. And that can be really useful for you if you want to try emulating C2 and again introducing other stimuli to see from a behavioral perspective what this potentially hostile software might be doing. Bear with me folks. So I'm just opening up a command shell. I'm using sudo space Wireshark, and I'm putting an ampersand there in the end. Uh, what that allows for is for Wireshark to run in the background, but for me to maintain control of my, my shell. Anyone know my password? I totally don't know. Okay. This is called password fatigue. <laughs> All right. Okay, so we've kind of set up some infrastructure effectively for Malco to, to interact with. We've set up a fake router effectively. We've set up a fake DNS server. And we're capturing traffic. So maybe that would be useful. Uh, Maybe not. Okay. Now, from a uh, uh, Windows perspective, uh, uh, as far as your Windows host, so your Flare workstation, if you have it, uh, there are some very useful <coughs> tools that you can use in order to help you get ready. Um, one of those tools is called PE Studio. Um, again, if you take your SCAR file and just drag it over PE Studio, It'll open up and it'll tell you a lot of things about that file. Okay, it's me. Oh, it's still spinning. So I'm just waiting for little indicators here to stop. Let me still talk about what's going on here. So what you get that's pretty useful is one, you get a signature, right? So one of the things I opened up with, I made a little tradecraft comment, is that you can use these cryptographic signatures, in this case an MD5, to check some of your public repositories to see if this has been seen before. And that can be really helpful because there's a lot of guys out there doing this, a lot of guys and gals, and, uh, and they're typically commenting in their blogs, they're commenting in these public repositories, and they can leave you a lot of nuggets things like what functions to pay attention to, indicators they found, and that can really give you a big jump start uh, on the work that you think you might need to be engaged in. And so we're just going to go ahead and do that just to be diligent. So so we did show this earlier. I'm just showing you guys what I would go through if I was doing it manual. And there it is. So I guess if 59 out of 66 vendors think it's bad, it might be bad. The other things that are kind of interesting here, and we have some of the same information from PE Studio. You know, we can look at the details. Uh, you know, for instance, you can see something called an IMP hash. That's actually a hash of all the imports. Um, sometimes you'll have uh, actors that will make small modifications to their uh, to their code in order to change the cryptographic signature of the software that they're trying to use against your environment. However, something that's sometimes hard to change because you have to change your software are all the libraries that you're dependent on in order to function. And so IMP hash specifically looks at all those imports and hashes only that. And so that can help you uh, sometimes create some continuity or are you looking at the same uh, family of software. Some of the other things, you know, PE32, so you know this is meant for, uh, you know, an 32-bit uh, uh, operating system. Uh, that can be really useful. SSD, uh, what's nice about SSD is assuming that there's no kind of uh, 
cryptography or packing involved with the MAL code, you can kind of get a percentage back how much it matches other samples. And so what's interesting about that is, uh, you know, you'll learn a malware analysis that you can defeat cryptography. And once you've defeated the cryptography, you're actually able to get, a lot in a lot of circumstances, the clear code. And then hashing that, using something like an SSD or IMP uh, hash, for an example, can give you a much better sense of, am I dealing with the same thing? What else is interesting? Again, creation times. When was it first seen in the wild? You know, it can kind of give you a sense of how unique or how bleeding edge is this. Um, you know, when I see something from 2010, I'm Googling like crazy. My, my hands are, you know, that means there's probably going to be other stuff out there, okay? If it says uh, 2017, two minutes ago, that's the first time it's been seen in the wild, you may be dealing with a real hot potato, maybe. Um, again, you can see when it was last analyzed. You can see, uh, you know, the debug artifacts, what the dates are in those, um, different file names that it was submitted under. Um, you can see for, uh, for instance, there's different sections within a PE file. What I find um, interesting when you look at the different sections that make up a PE file is this value called entropy. What entropy deals with is randomness of values uh, within that file. The closer you get to the number seven, the more random the data is. Typically, a lot of randomness is usually an indication of compression or encryption. And so if you've got kind of lower entropy, and then also your entropy gets real close to seven with a particular se uh, section, especially like a dot text, there's probably some packed code in there. Uh, again, imports. Imports can tell you a lot. Um, I'm definitely uh, not rain manned up enough to, uh, to tell you guys what, what every DLL does. Um, I do have a cheat sheet that I, I will share that will help a lot of y'all, and I will make some uh, book references on the GitHub so you can uh, pull from what's in the public domain to help you in this area. But like, what jumps out at me very quickly, when INET, to me what that says is we have network capability, okay? And then when I open that up, I can see that there's very specific function calls that are happening. And when I look at those function calls, I see HTTP protocol, I see cookies being used, I see, uh, you know, we're, we're possibly writing files. Um, you know, my, my little bit of experience doing this, uh, this is start, starting to look like it, like it has downloader capability. That's an assessment I can make right there just by looking at, again, what is being imported and what functions are being called. <coughs> you see where I'm going with this? Okay. We're going to keep moving. Um, there's some other references here to some of the different uh, resources. Um, and then there's some XF uh, information. This is sometimes kind of interesting. You can maybe see uh, what the code was compiled with. Um, and then behaviorally, uh, this is really interesting. So we're looking for network indicators. But what's in front of us right now? Those are your network indicators. You can see what domains are being called. You can kind of see some of the parameters that that specific domain is expecting. Um, if you want to go full offensive, uh, and, and guys, don't do this. Never go full offensive. That's that's for governments to do. Don't do it as a, as a private citizen. Or if you do, let me do an anonymization class. We can talk through how to protect yourself if you're in a different country. Um, but the point, though, is, is that here are our network indicators. And we haven't done a thing. We just looked at the hash. Pretty powerful stuff. So open source intelligence, definitely check that block. Again, IPs that are involved, ports that are involved, that's really important. You can quickly, uh, from a, let's say, we're, we're just going to do some bog forensics, right? You can hand this to your first responders, your incident responders, your intrusion analysts. And you say, guys, look for this. If you see it, whoever's doing it, they're now in scope for this incident. Boom, we're rocking. Right there, we're rocking, guys. We are, we are now actively defending. However, we're not done yet because we came here to do more than that. We're going to pretend like we didn't find any of this. We're going to try to. Okay.
So PE Studio, again, this is just one tool. There's tons of tools. Uh, we're going to cover this one. This technique that I'm using right now, so we, so we just use open source intelligence. We're setting up for behavior analysis, and we're doing static analysis by using a tool like PD Studio, okay? Um, again, would it pop right off the back for us or indicators, okay? And this is uh, PD Studio trying to tell you why it thinks there may be something funny about the file that you're dealing with. Um, the file references to the protection of virtual address space, you know, that could be an indication of DLL injection. Um, again, 41 counts of memory management functions. Uh, I mean, there, there's quite a bit going on here. Um, again, you know, with Windows, you know, you're kind of expecting stuff assigned to the digital certificate if it's going to be legitimate. Um, so that's kind of interesting. No versioning in the file. <coughs> Checksum is weird. A uh, lot, lot of good stuff in here. Um, guys, we're going to keep it moving. Um, but indicators, the imported libraries, again, we just saw this in virus total. Here it is. This tool is bringing it out for you. The symbols that are being seen. Symbols are references to the functions that are being used from the libraries. And again, you can kind of see uh, what that's connected to. The reason why this would aid us as malware analysts is that, again, if we get into where we've got to start breaking down code, this allows us to find specific parts in the code to target and add breakpoints where when the software is executing, the minute it gets to our this thing called a breakpoint, the software will pause, and now we have our opportunity to control the flow of the code. And that's a big advantage, guys. And so uh, what I tend to hone in on, especially since we're looking for, and for this moment, is network indicators, is I quickly look for you know, what function call is related to a network indicator. I should have sorted this alphabetically. But there it is. So I'm going to look for anything that's HTTP uh, when we start getting into uh, the code analysis piece of this. Okay, we're almost ready, guys. But again, I said we're here to do memory analysis. Uh, and of course, I did want to show you some of the other steps you typically go through. So on your Flare machines, you should have access to Process Hacker. Let's go ahead and open that up. Matter of fact, make sure you're running it as administrator, okay? Glance at it, recognize what it is that's ready in memory. That's going to help you minimize it. The other thing we want to go ahead and fire is something called reg shut. Well, go ahead and open up uh, Ida Pro as well. I want to make sure I open up the same. It is going to yell at me because my icon is what it expects. Um, go ahead and uh, open up Ollie. I'm just going to kind of minimize that. All right, guys. Once you have those applications open, you're going to execute something called Reg Shot. And what Reg Shot does is it's going to look at. Um, Currently, what files are on the file system, uh, what the current settings are within the registries. You know, when it comes to Windows, Windows stores its most important configuration information, everything that makes your user experience what it is inside something called registries. And there's a lot of registries, and the reason why this makes it simple is that we're going to take a snapshot of all those registries, and this thing is going to return to us what the differences are after we execute our bad code. And again, guys, if you're doubting me, feel free to uh, pull up your favorite forensic tool, open up all those registries, and then start hunting for changes. This is the easy way. Believe me. All right, so this is now done. Tell or little ticker here stop going on. Okay, you should now be able to take Scar. We're going to rename Scar. 
and we're going to take that file extension and we're going to change it to exe. Okay? Now it's executable. Okay. Oh. Get it out of my PD Studio. Thanks, PD Studio. You did a great job. Ready to tap out? Good. Up on the end. Okay, so we're going to take SCAR first. We're going to drag it into IDA. Now, I talked about debugging as our focus. I do want to show you um, wow, um, not debugging, but disassembly specifically. And so, what's different it's between disassembly versus debugging? Is that with disassembly, we're not executing code. Rather, we're just analyzing code and looking at what it is uh, that we can find without ever running the code. And we could probably find everything we're looking for using disassembly, uh, but again, we have such a controlled environment, there's no reason for us not to go through debugging. But I would like to show you what you might do from a disassembly perspective. From a disassembly perspective, what's interesting is that within IDA, we can take a quick look and see all the functions that are going to be called by the software. Okay? And so I mentioned earlier that we we're interested in all those HTTP communications. Typically, like WSA startup, that's kind of interesting. So scrolling through that list, you could find like the Git HTTP, uh, and then once you see that, simply by double clicking within IDA, it'll actually take you to that section of code. Okay. And once you're in that section of code, you can actually click on those functions within IDA. Click X, and you can see all the places that actually call um, this function called WS. SA startup, which is typically uh, one of the first functions you'll call if you're going to be engaged in network communications. So only, again, I clicked X, that gives me the cross reference that says where in the code it's being called. Okay. And then I just selected the reference and I clicked OK, now I'm in that part of the code. But what I can do next that's kind of interesting is if I hit the space bar, I now get a visual view on how that fits within the code. Okay. Again, we could bust this thing right here just doing plain old code analysis without doing any debugging. But that's still not what we're here for. So I'm going to stop there. Just know that you can do disassembly instead of debugging. Okay, let's look at this from a debugger perspective. Now, what ends up being important to me is I've got to first figure out where I want to add a breakpoint okay, within this software. Uh, but right now, I don't don't know where that is. So in my debugger, what I'm going to do is grab the executable that I'm interested in. Grab the executable that I'm interested in. And we're going to take SCAR and we're going to drop them in there. And what the debugger will try to do, now this isn't going to be true for you in all situations, but what the debugger will try to do is set a breakpoint on where the software starts. There we go. Now, a lot of malware authors will do things to protect themselves uh, from you being able to do debugging. Uh, fortunately, in this case, we're able to do a little bit, a little bit of debugging to figure out what's going on without having to consider all the anti-analysis uh, defenses this code may possibly have. Um, where we're at in the code, this is kind of like we've entered the main function of the code. Uh, for my C, uh, C, C++ programmers out there. And what we're going to do is just iteratively walk through this. But before I do that, I did mention that I was going to talk through stack, memory, and registers. And so from a stack, memory, register perspective, we're going to run through pretty quickly, but we'll slow it down a lot when we start doing individual uh, <coughs> those issues to go through that. Um, 
One, you have a register, again, this is CPU register, it's called EAX. What EAX does is it catches the return value of functions that you have executed. So if you make a function call, once the function call is done, the value of that is stored in EAX. ECX is typically used for uh, counters. Um, so if we're going through, we're doing like a, um, you know, a, a iterative, um, you know, long's i is less than 10, you know, keep executing this, uh, you know, conditional statement or some kind of a while loop. Uh, again, ECX is typically used as a counter. Um, again, um, EDX, uh, EDX, those are storing uh, references to different parts, um, you know, the code, whatever the code's choosing to store there. We also have the stack pointer. Um, again, that's pointing to where we're at on the memory stack, okay? And so if you look at that value, the 14FF84, I'm just moving my mouse down. And this section is the stack, okay? And you can see ESP is pointing to the top of the stack. It's really important. EBP relates to uh, a pointer, uh, and this is called a base pointer. And that's typically uh, used by the function calls to keep track of uh, where the variables are on the stack. You also have ESI. Look, what I tell you, Malco can use this stuff in non-traditional ways. So I'm telling you very traditional things. Again, you got to look at what your code's doing. It, it may not use it like this. Um, again, ESI is typically for inputs. Okay, so if we want to move. Uh, you know, something like maybe we have a reference to a heap. Um, again, we're going to stick that address in here. And then EDI is a, a pointer to an output uh, potentially from a function call or a calculation that's occurring. Okay. Um, and then finally, we have our instruction pointer. And again, if we look at that value, I'm just connecting the dots here. That's pointing to the current instruction we're on. Lots of stuff to remember here. Finally, um, just to kind of bring us to a close as far as the debrief on what's happening within the GUI, we can see based on what we have selected, we can see what the values are. Typically, the value on the right is applied to the value on the left, okay? So in this case, we have a push statement. And so what this is showing us is uh, pushes, generally we're putting something onto the stack. And so when we go down here, it's telling you, well, if you're going to push, where you're pushing to is this address, which is going to be the address above where the top of the stack is, okay? And we're pushing this uh, a base 10 value of 96, or in hex, 60. What's key here, guys, is I don't know about you, I am not really good at converting uh, you know, hex value in the base 10 in my head. That's not what I do. And so it, one of the advantages right now is that the software is doing that for you. If there's like an ASCII translation for what's going on, again, you're going to see it right here in the center of the screen, okay? So that's really, really helpful, guys. So you're not trying to do it on your own. Some of you, uh, again, if you choose to go forward with learning more, I know, guys, uh, again, we're able to do this. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not one of them. Um, and then finally, the only thing we haven't covered is over here on the left. Um, this is, this is me uh, memory outright that's been allocated to this software. And so uh, what's useful about that is, is that whether we're looking at the code itself or we're down in memory, we can jump to any part of that we want by using control G and then we can start typing an address. And so if we're like, Hmm. The ESI is pointed at 40F470. Okay. Make sure I typed all that right. You know, we can quickly click, click go, and now we're brought to that point. Now we know that's the main function because that's where we've been the whole time. But I think you guys get my point. Same thing with uh, memory. You know, we could go down from a memory perspective and again put in that same address and say, show me where it's at, and that's what it looks like in memory. Again, if you look at the hex dump itself, that matches 
the raw hex that's over here that's being interpreted as a push 60. All right. So what we're going to do now is iteratively walk through the program um, or step through the program. Uh, you can see when I hover over this particular icon, it says step into. You also could use a hotkey of F7. Uh, I'm a mouse clicker, so I'm just going to kind of start clicking and looking for stuff that might be interesting to me. So we know a, a value of, uh, again, a hex value 6O has been pushed to the stack. Again, you can see the ASCII interpretation of that, not real interesting. We see an offset being pushed to the stack. That's actually a reference. That's actually a reference to our starting place in the code. Now we have a function call occurring, which is going to take us out of the code. So again, push, we're putting stuff onto the stack. When you see call, that means we're now referencing a function. Let's see what's happening in that function. And down here, you can see the destination for the function call. The reason why I'm pointing that out to you is this could be a call to a API. An API is all those imports or those DLLs that we saw earlier see what's going on in this function. So what's going to happen is the function uh, will typically when you have a function call you're going to try to save uh, where you just uh, came into the function from. And you're going to try saving uh, the current state of all the pointers. Now I'm going to speed this up just a little bit uh, and I just want to get to uh, showing you guys why this is called SCAR, and then we're going to find, then I'm going to show you a faster way that we can find our network indicators uh, beyond setting a breakpoint uh, on the actual function call that will cause a network communication. Okay, a lot of different function calls here. Again, uh, typically if I'm working with software uh, for the first time, okay, what's interesting here is we see a reference to module. That means now we've left the actual application itself. There is a button right here that will cause execute until there's a return. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't want that. We want to execute until there's user code, and that will put us back into SCAR. Now we're back into SCAR, we're going to keep executing. And again, what I'm watching right now is just this window. I'm seeing what values are being passed around. Again, we're back into kernel 32. Not interested, I want. a little bit deeper down. So what I will show you, I'm going to have to click here a little faster, but what I will show you is that this application, uh, you can kind of see how it got its identity. Um, that's kind of what I'm making my way towards.
I was going to show how the uh, why this is called Scar and why it was named that way. Uh, I probably should have just saved the uh, exact address space. I guess it takes a lot that. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to stop on that. I was hoping I could show you guys. Yeah. Unfortunately, uh, you know, when you're by yourself, the time that's going by right now is quite so long. So I'm going to hit the play button, and that's going to let the software fully execute. And so, oh look, it popped up Adobe Help Viewer. All right, that's that's kind of odd. And I don't know if I want that. I'm going to try and close it. Well, what's happened now is my system uh, has been uh, yeah, effectively just compromised. What's going on? So you can see SCAR is still running. So from a memory forensic perspective, uh, what we're able to do is we can actually look at the process for SCAR because we saw that there was a function call um, to create an HTTP communication. We can go into the memory that's currently decoded, uh, you know, if there was any crypto, we can click on strings, okay? And again, this is a live way to do memory analysis. And we just say that, hey, we're only interested in strings that are over 10 characters in length, okay? Now we have a list. Well, there's 623 results. I've got to be honest, guys, that's a lot to go through. However, I do know that, again, there was a reference to HTTP. So I'm going to go ahead and filter on HTTP and see what I get. Oh, look, subset of results referencing HTTP. You know what's interesting about our subset of results? That does match what we saw in virus total. So that's kind of cool. We just validated a publicly available indicator. But again, that's not why we're here. We're here to use debugging to actually find all of our network indicators. So what I would do, since we have addresses over here, earlier I was showing that we could jump to any one of these addresses. And looking at these, I'm going to choose to use the 14FA34. back over and down in memory I'm going to do a control G I'm just going to go straight to this address oh look there it is well that's kind of interesting we're also going to see if we can spot it within the instructions no instructions however we do have a section of memory that is being referenced now what we could do is that a breakpoint, a hardware breakpoint? What's important between hardware uh, versus software breakpoints is that when it comes to memory, um, in order to uh, interrupt processing, you have to use a hardware uh, breakpoint. But we're still not done yet. Again, we had a number of addresses I'm just kind of curious where those other addresses may lead us. And this one's a little more complete. And the reason why we go about doing this, uh, again, you could be saying to yourself, oh, we got the domain. The reason why you go about doing this is a lot of times when it comes to malicious software, uh, the creator could pack many of these domains in there for resilience. It is possible, too, that these domains could have been created dynamically, okay? And so what we want to figure out as an analyst is, is that true in this circumstance? And so again, within our software, within the debugger, control G, we're pasting over this address, we're jumping to it, And so since this is within the flow of the code, 
We're going to add a break point there. Okay. Well, we have a couple break points, and typically for me, from an analysis perspective, assuming I haven't cheated and I didn't just go, it's not really cheating, um, assuming that I haven't just set break points where the Windows API calls are to create the web communications, let's say our guy uh, did something uh, to hide those calls from us, uh, this might be an approach that we would use to deal with that, okay? Uh, and again, that's creating these breakpoints where we see references to these domains. Within the debugger, you have a restart, which again will restart the malcode. But before I do that, there was one other thing that I was running from a behavioral perspective that I do want to share uh, because this is a part of memory forensics as well in memory analysis, and that is Redshot. Okay? Um, we've already got it open. We're going to go ahead and take our second shot. Let's do it, and let's see what indicators we get from that perspective. Okay. Again, the only thing I clicked is we did first shot when we started the machine, we did second shot, and then we clicked the compare button. This is all the stuff that's been added to the system since we've executed the code. So a lot of interesting stuff here. To me, what I typically look for is how do we create persistence if, if we are the malware author. And we're not going to spend a lot of time digging because that's not the point of this session. Again, we're hunting for network indicators. But look. We have a reference uh, with, within our run once key, which means this will run again, to this particular uh, file on the file system. Now, what that says to me now is, because that's not the file, again, if we go back to Process Hacker, Process Hacker is busy spinning memory, and it's trying to give us uh, you know, what's going on. But what we don't see in Process Hacker is a reference to that file. I don't see that file name anywhere. And so what that says to me is, as a malware analyst, is that, you know, I know I'm hunting for network communications, but I also just had a file drop to the operating system. So originally I started with a hypothesis, maybe this is a downloader, but it's also a dropper, and it just created persistence on your system. That's really useful from all those other domains I said that you could complement by doing this kind of analysis. Okay, let's get back on track. Okay, I'm getting sense of the time here. All right, so what we would do, again, this is currently paused. I would click, it looks like a rewind button, and that's just going to restart the software. And we're going to let the software execute this time until it hits our break point. So boom, now it's hit our break point. Again, guys, just being sensitive to time, I'm going to go ahead and just kind of get uh, to the answer. Uh, the method I showed you would lead you to where uh, the stuff is happening. Uh, since I know uh, WSA start uh, is how you would do the lowest level of network communication, you would start building it up from there. I'm going to go ahead and create a breakpoint within our software at the, uh, the address where that's actually being called. Uh, the way I would do that is I would go back to Ollie. I would click within the section that's showing your code executing. I would do uh, so in Ida, it's G to go to an address. In Ollie, it's Control G. Okay. Drop the address in there. Search for it. Drop the 
address in there. Oh, there it is. We're going to go ahead and add a breakpoint. Okay. Restart our software. We're going to execute until it reaches our breakpoint. Nope. hit our breakpoint. All right, so now that we've hit our breakpoint, again, I said this API call is where we would start to build the network communication. Um, what I've skipped over is how that would be built, how, as far as what's going to be spoken to. But I do want to point out what's all over the place if you guys aren't just seeing it clearly from your seats. Again, we're about to make this function call, and what do we have? We have a reference to a memory address that has a uh, clear uh, value to a domain. We know that we're about to do a function call for network communications. Um, you have this string. I bet you if I were to follow where that string is, I would probably learn that that section, this 14F448, is probably where the obfuscated domain exists. And so if I was going to hunt for other domains it might speak to, I would go to this space uh, within the file. Again, that's the address, so if you wanted to hop to it right now and take a look, you could do that. Uh, the other thing that's interesting, again, this is our CPU registers down here on our stack. We can see what's been added to the stack, and look what's down here. Again, our domain. So, as an analyst, um, just by recognizing simple function calls, and especially when you know you have a specific objective like to farm network indicators, you can, uh, from a disassembly perspective, figure out what that address is. So when you pull into your debugger, again, you can go straight to that by putting in that address that you got from your disassembler, add a breakpoint, let the code execute. As soon as it tries to make that function call, guess what we're greeted with? A whole bunch of indicators and also additional pivots because you know Again, that looks like something obfuscated. At least to me it does. Before I wrap this up, guys, I just want to point out from a behavioral perspective, the entire time we've been controlling all the network communications. And so the point about doing a triage is that a lot of this you can get without ever uh, really having to get to the point that we got to. That was with a wink, wink, wink. <laughs> Thought I was doing any of this, but I meant to do it all, right? Yeah, about that the problem. I'm going to go ahead and execute this code as you can see it. So that was my bad on the config. I didn't put the right uh, DNS in there. dropping other files. Well, guys, I'm going to troubleshoot this on my own time. Um, I think you guys get the gist of it as far as setting up your uh, control environment. I'm not sure why we're not connecting right now. 
Um, this is uh, the bane of doing live presentations, trying to do live analysis, so you guys can respect that. Um, okay, so we're going to stop here. Um, Are you trying to capture the packets the malware sense? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, that was the intent. Um, and again, the way that I went about doing that was to make sure that everything, again, was connected to this host. Uh, we the so there is you know, like, yeah, no, I took down one point two. That doesn't exist anymore. Is there so many points for that? Uh, I don't think so. There's only... Oh, so sweet. And then from a See, IT kind of perspective, the control I tried to make sure that we were set to be on the same board. network. Yeah, no, he's not trying to do that. I'm late. I take that. Perspective. The nice thing is, if you've taken your snapshot, if you feel like uh, again you just didn't get everything you wanted, you could just snap back, rinse and repeat everything you just did. Say again. Oh, oh, these are impossible yeah. ideas. There are DNS queries coming in. Okay. Let's restart our mal code. It's just dropping all kinds of files on me. So even when it runs into the vendor, it's actually breaking the DNS machine. So let me repeat that back. So, so uh, it sounds like you're asking, uh, even though it's running on the debugger, it actually is executing on the machine. Is that the question? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, and that's kind of uh, it's kind of your advantage with the debugger right there. That's our that's kind of a weird communication. And so, had I had this the IP configured correctly, uh, what we would have gotten before we ever started as analysts is what DNS communications were coming off this host prior to compromise, and then after we compromised the system, we then would have been able to quickly spot, hey, there's a difference in this this network indicator would have jumped out at us. But yes, the advantage of the debugger is is that we can execute um, the code live. We can actually see uh, any time I can click pause and I can see what instruction it's on within the code. Uh, and then the other thing too is uh, typically when you start a debugger up, again, it's going to try to freeze the software, the, the software that you're analyzing. Uh, right at main, which is you know when when the uh, software first starts running, uh, and that gives you an opportunity as an analyst to strategically place uh, something called a software breakpoint on key functions that you may have picked up on to begin with, or uh, key uh, memory sections that you may have found through other means, uh, kind of like uh, the disassembly analysis that we we're doing over here. Or, uh, for an example, uh, we didn't see the references to the functions. Um, you know, when we're doing static analysis by just looking up, you know, from an open source intelligence perspective, the hash itself within VirusTotal, we saw the function calls that were being made. Again, we can look out for those as an analyst. Um, you know, we start actually going through the code. I hope I answered your question there. Probably in a really rough way. Um, yeah, the, the short and sweet is is that that you want to you want to find what the address is of what it is you're interested in using a disassembler. You can move the software there. You can either look at the imports or look at the functions. 
um, by looking at the imports, you can spot what it is you're interested in. Right here on the left, you have the address that's associated with it. That same address, that 4180A4, matches the address that you'll see when it starts running within your debugger. And so you can set a breakpoint there and then monitor as far as what values are within the registry, I'm sorry, within, within the CPU registers on your stack uh, and actually in memory. So you kind of be looking at those three places. And then, uh, again, your control over the program comes from, uh, in this example, uh, some of the functions that you have built inherently into the debugger, like stepping through. And you can see when I use this feature called step through, I'm going line by line by line in the code. And so it gives you a chance to uh, look at what's going on with the software uh, at a speed that people work at, rather than, you know, if I click play, it's going to spin through thousands of instructions back to back. Do you guys have uh, any other questions just as far as what I've shown up here? Does all this tell you where this where SCAR originated from? We may have said it in our slide. Okay. So, um, when it comes to origination, origination is, is, is really tough. Um, when, we, when we think about origination, if you mean like, how did it get to where we had access to it? Yeah. Yeah. Um, sometimes. Um, the reason why I say sometimes is, you know, if, if it's actually made it somewhere where you have visibility from an from an analytic perspective, like your intrusion analyst, for an example, like that's a role you could play on a team. They can actually work backwards, right? They can say, well, it's this system. We know it arrived at this time. Um, our malware analyst just gave us these network indicators when it starts communicating. And so you can look then within uh, logs and kind of, from a time perspective, work backwards because you know it's this computer at this time spoke to this. And so you go to that location of time within your logs and start working backwards to say, well, how did it get there to begin with? And that's something the intrusion analysts would do. And of course, the way you would empower them is by giving them uh, this, this thing that I'm calling indicator of compromise, which is this network IOC, which is the uh, domain. Um, that we found with, within uh, within our analysis. So we know, great great question. Please keep asking them. I, I do you know as much as possible. I do want to try to connect what the value is again uh, that you bring to the table if you choose to develop the skill set. Yeah. And again, just be sensitive that uh, you know. You know, I'm, I'm up here fiddling around, you know, when you start doing this, time goes by pretty quick. But I find affection in a lot of these tools, they'll actually, uh, some of them will actually tell you how much time you spend, uh, you know, trying to bust the code. I think Ollie was one of them. But it's interesting, though, how much time will go by while you're in behavior. Uh, and, and that's why it's really important to recognize, you know, uh, what, what you can bring to the table with the exactly. skill set is that there's the, there's really low hanging fruit that you can get fast. Again, using the static analysis technique. And today, the one static analysis technique. And there's lots of techniques. Is I use this one tool. It's called PE Studio. I drug the software into it. Gave us some quick information back. And again, uh, as an analyst, uh, you know you quickly look at that and give feedback to a team. Uh, using the cryptographic signature, again, we're able to go out to this public repository, and here's this behavior tab. What's in the behavior tab? Network indicators. Sometimes you're not that lucky, and that's really when you may have, may have to roll up your sleeves and go a little bit further doing some of the memory analysis techniques I showed you where we used a tool, uh, in my opinion, that's as simple as Process Explorer, uh, called Process Hacker. You know, we went to our, our known bad guy's uh, file, because we're the ones who ran this file. You know, we right-clicked on it, we said Properties. 
Here's this memory section, click strings, that stuff that's going to be human readable. And then I started searching through it, right? We knew uh, just by looking, uh, you know, in virus total that there was a reference to HTTP. And so when I look at the strings, again, you click filter, contains HTTP, what am I left with? Well, it's not as useful as the results we got earlier, but you guys get my point. It might still be interesting. You get my point, though. That uh, you know, uh, I hope you get my point. As far as you know, from an analysis perspective, there are things that you can gain very quickly. Um, you know, from multiple sources, and sometimes you may get down to where you have to do kind of this behavioral analysis. But again, just by setting up. Uh, you know, this fake DNS service, having a Wireshark capture going on, we can now see, again, what domains are being queried, and even what communications that software hopes to participate in when it speaks to those domains. Um, example. So, in this scenario, it tried speaking to uh, our control server, which was the Remnux server, uh, unfortunately, uh, because we did not have a web service enabled, and here's your control factor, there was nothing for it to speak to. So when it tried creating this TCP uh, handshake, there was no service there. But now what we could do is, now that we know that as analysts, we could turn up a web service and say, let's see what you request next. And again, you're farming for more indicators that you can feed back to all those different functional areas that I listed earlier in the presentation. Oh, yeah. It's a lot to take in. <laughs> it is a lot, but it's very doable. No, we got it recorded. <laughs> oh, you, oh, you're recording all of it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm going to have to chop some of that up, like some long pauses. Okay. Um, so you guys have any other? There's, there's really no bad questions, guys. This, in my opinion, it's you know there is some heaviness, um, but again, if you guys are willing uh, and interested in jumping in, uh, I have great public references that can help you uh, learn this uh, pretty quickly. And no matter what you guys choose to do professionally in the cyber field, there's many places you can go to. Uh, again, this this skill uh, will complement you no matter what you choose to do. No, no. So what's so the assembly was created by uh, our our software, the Ida Pro, uh, and the Ali DBG in this example. Um, and the way it does that, it looks at you know the raw ones and zeros, and it, it interprets that in order to put it back into a presentable format, which is the assembly, which is what people can read. Because you can learn assembly, you know, but you know what you probably couldn't do, um, or at least I can't. Uh, you know, I'm sure there's people who can. You know, I can't just look at, for instance, this hex and say, "Oh, it's pushing to the stack right there." You know, that's <laughs> you know, there are people who can do that, uh, but it, that might be you guys. <laughs> it's not me. Though. Are you gonna have like full? Is there going to be malware that's written in Java and you're going to be tracing Java code for the debugger? Sure, and depending on how the mal code's written, uh, and I've got lots of mal code, lots out there, but um, there's a, there's other ways you go about busting Java. You know, and the other interesting thing too is you know I didn't put it up there, but I know a lot. I think I think a lot of the club, uh, this particular club, is uh, really interested in pen testing. Uh, you know, a natural place, in my opinion, to go to if you're on the pen testing side is vulnerability analysis. You know, developing these skills, you know, this is also called reverse engineering, you know, can also lead you into the vulnerability analysis space where you can find opportunities uh, in, you know, vendor software. So, uh, again, you know, this could be a jump off point to something else you may do later professionally. SCAR, so SCAR ends up being a downloader, uh, is what it does in, in practice. Um, SCAR persists, so if I were to, right now, so I would, at, at the end of my analysis, I would do my report, maybe I'd do a snapshot, because maybe I want to come back later and see the machine at this state. Um, 
but let's say I didn't snap back and I gave this thing internet access, but, but I rebooted it or something, SCAR would still try to, would, would stay on the machine, and the, and the minute I gave it internet access, it would go out there to the internet, and whoever the owner is, whoever they're selling this service to, um, you could probably get context around that, um, but that's not what today is. Um, we can get into that in another presentation. Um, it would then pull down their software and give them access in whatever way the, the software pulls down as opposed to. So, but you know, uh, if you look at SCAR, SCAR also has some other functions that I didn't explore, uh, like around debugger detection, things like that. So I think there's a little bit more in SCAR to be discovered uh, with respect to IOCs and functionality. So again, you know, one of one of the things uh, on the table, guys. Uh, you know, if you want to spend more time with Scar, there is more to be found. So Scar is giving like the whatever those people like remote access to this machine. Or? I haven't proved that, um, but what I do know Scar does is it, it will download uh, from a third-party website additional uh, softwares, which I haven't explored. Uh, some language they use uh, in the industry is they'll talk about things in stages. And so you could say SCAR is stage one. And then typically there's a stage two code. Normally the way uh, I'm going to call them adversaries work is adversaries will use uh, this low value off the shelf software against SCAR. It was first seen back in 2010 out in the wild, right? So it's a low value software, but you'll use SCAR to, to if, again, if we, if we really wanted to farm for intelligence, we could see what software comes later. And that software that comes later is usually higher value, less in public distribution, and might, may even give you some ideas. Uh, you'll hear a term in the industry around attribution <coughs> on who it is, the actor is, that, that may actually have been the one who's behind this low value software called SCAR. But, you know, uh, just like you're all learning the practice of security. Uh, you know, whoever these actors are that are out there, uh, you know, they could be, uh, you know, everything from just people trying to rob the bank to, uh, again, countries that are funding, you know, professional, you know, military teams. Uh, and and all most of these folks, depending on their skill level, uh, typically want to show all their cards right in the beginning. And so uh, it is possible for you to get into other spaces where uh, you present an environment in order to gain more knowledge of who your opponent is. You mentioned the documentation for a simpler. Yes. Do you have any favorite sources that you go to for that? Absolutely. Um, so you guys see me using Remnux up here um, at home. I, I do use Flare. Everything I post on the GitHub is what I use at home. Uh, a lot of what I'm showing you here I use on the professional side. So there's a private professional blending here. Um, but Sands Institute, there's this guy named uh, Lenny. Uh, now I'm going to forget his last name. Uh, anyways, Lenny maintains the Remnux website. He has cheat sheets there for assembly. Uh, for uh, this malware analysis, everything. Um, I will post some of my sources. Again, if you guys catch me on LinkedIn, um, I, I do have some posts around this there. And you know, they're just when I see a cheat sheet, it's a single page, uh, and, and the reference is is pretty handy. You can probably dig in and do SCAR on your own just using cheat sheets, in my opinion. Again, Lenny Sands Institute. This is also. Let, there we go, Lenny's Elser, thank you. Elser, is that what this is? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I will kick some uh, links back so you guys will have them on your uh, wiki for the club. From Sumos. Yeah. Is Scar like gateway malware? Gateway malware. Um, <laughs> no, so the term I like to use is downloader, um, and I think that's kind of the industry accepted term. Um, if you check out Malware Unicorn, the RE, uh, 101 that, that, that's out there. Um, she does share some of the common terms. Now, I, I do want to caution you that there, there are terms that are used to describe the functionality of software. But a lot of times with malware, you can't have multiple functions within some malware. 
it doesn't have to just do one thing. You could have something that's a downloader and a backdoor and a keylogger. You know, it doesn't have to just be one of these categories of things. You know, it just depends on what the author intended with the software that he created. Until next meeting, which is great because the next meeting is our last meeting. Uh, so, our original last meeting was going to be November 17th, but because that's the Friday right before our Thanksgiving break, give people travel opportunity and stuff like that. So, canceled that. So, our last meeting is going to be November 3rd, two weeks from now, uh, and we'll do our hands on activity. And I'm thinking, I've got a couple other ideas, I'll shoot them out. But uh, we'll definitely do our hands-on activity then. Uh, this hands-on activity is going to be really cool uh, because it's going to combine everything we've learned about this form coding, uh, kind of like website analysis stuff, uh, plus our manual exploitation uh, that we've done both on the, the Windows XP machine and the Windows World War III. Uh, and we're going to look at a couple of other things that we've all learned how to do. So if you go back and watch the videos and, and research up, you'll be able to uh, really connect those dots. Uh, so, I'm going to let everybody go. Before I do that, I want to make uh, two more announcements. Uh, first one, I want to remind everybody that uh, this coming Tuesday, we are having our Locktoberfest. It's going to be an awesome Lockview Village. We're having some guys from uh, the Augusta Lock Sports uh, come in, and they're going to provide us a Lockview Village and some professional expertise. So if you've never Lockview before, these guys can help you learn how. So we're really excited for that. You can also buy, I'm sure, some lock books and lock from them in the as well. So that'll be Tuesday from 12.30 to 1.30, so kind of like lunch some areas if you're available then. Stop by, I believe it's in room CCT 208. And uh, so that's going to be lots of fun. And, um, Lisa, Lisa. Oh, yeah, yeah. Lisa, I don't know if anybody else did, but Lisa, uh, our treasurer, made a poster for the uh, contest. So. Look for her if you don't already have a book somewhere else. I would obviously do that But, uh, Oh, oh, yes, yes, that's very important. The next meeting, because it's the last meeting, is also elections. So while there is not a uh, limit, we can't, there's no restricted voting limit based on the amount of members here. We really want you to come so we have a nice, fair, clean election as many people as possible. Because we've had elections in the past with like five people, and it's like, well, we got to do it. Everybody go. So uh, we are having elections at our last meeting. We'll all positions will be available. And if this seems kind of weird to you, that's because it is. Uh, our elections usually actually happen at the end of the semester. We had the weird thing that happened at the beginning of the semester, we had our president leaving. So these are our real, normal, regular scheduled elections. So those are our next meeting, so be ready for that. I will send emails about that, out about that. And then, like I said, at the beginning of the meeting, I need volunteers for the 30th for the Grand Open. So please, if you are available, send me an email or come talk to me after the meeting. But for that, you guys are good. You say the lock was Tuesday 1230 to 130? Yes. Okay. Before I forget, though, I'll show you guys this report. Where's that, man? Dude, I, was, I, got lost. I tried. Like, you killed something. Casey, I tried. You, you so, locked me out when you started modifying it because I was in. And then I couldn't find it again. Well, all I did was reboot machines when they started breaking. So I was just playing with this as admin role. Um, yeah. So, so I got all I got these agi- two. I got these agitated. two are the easiest to get. So I wanted to mess with y'all. Say, if I can get this, and you still can't. Uh-huh. So, <laughs> the other two machines are a little bit harder. However, you should know how to get this one. We got a whole meeting. I got angry and I did rm slash rf dash star. Yeah. That's <laughs> why <laughs>